it. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing this afternoon? Good? Having a good dice? Um, so, we're going to talk about Star Citizen. I mean, the theme of DICE 2015 is Without Borders. And if I was going to think of a project that would typify something that is without borders, I would definitely think Star Citizen would be one of them. Um, so, Star Citizen Without Borders, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Crowd. $72 million. That's a big number. But it's not the whole Star Citizen story by a long way. So Star Citizen represents a radically different approach to development and publishing. And I'd like to think that our success is no fluke. Developers and even publishers around here, I'm sure there's a few in the audience, uh, I think can embrace the way we go about things um, for surprising or beneficial results. Um, the world's changing, and uh, we decided from the very beginning, it was kind of one of the big inspirations of uh, what I was trying to do with Star Citizen to approach it in a very different way, in a way that the, the sort of technology of, the, of today and the connection of today allows you to, to connect with an audience in a very different way. So you know, it's an interconnected world, shares its preferences, interests, desires at the speed of light. Uh, instant communication can take down dictatorships, turn good ideas into billion dollar companies, and make house cats uh, celebrities. Um, so the time has come to embrace your audience. The time has come to join the crowd, or at least that's the way I feel. Um, so you know, one of the aspects that the you know without borders works for us is the funding. Obviously, that's gotten us to where we are. Um, you know, we don't need a publisher's green light. Um, we don't need to give up our IP, and hopefully, I'm not compromising my vision. Um, so, Kickstarter, Airbnb, Uber, Grubhub, all remove the middlemen, allow a direct connection between the consumers and the providers. So, the thought behind Star Citizen when I was first doing it uh, was, why not go directly to your ultimate audience and help them fund a game they want to play and reward? for helping make it a reality. And that was actually true even before uh, we did the crowdfunding. My initial plan was actually to take a sort of Minecraft model, uh, which would be to sort of build the initial prototype and an alpha, and then um, sort of share it out there at a reduced price and continue to build it as people joined and, and sort of um, you know, join the ranks of the people testing and playing the alpha, and uh, sort of migrated into using crowdfunding as, as part of that device. So uh, on, you know, the start of the campaign, we had uh, you know, a golden ticket uh, site where we basically created a site 30 days before the, uh, we, I was announcing the game. And it was literally a site to aggregate a community of people that liked space games, that liked PC games, and liked some of my games. And we had about 10,000 people sign up uh, in the first day. And by the time that we announced the game at GDC, Net, uh, well, GDC Online, now called GDC Next, it's in LA, but it was in Austin at the time. Um, we had about 32,000 members of our community already before we'd even said what the game was. Um, so we started the first day of crowdfunding in uh, October 10th of 2012 in Austin, Texas. And uh, from the very beginning, we have focused on the fostering the community and sort of generating contents and engaging them and doing updates while we were going through the initial campaign. And there's a sort of energy that comes with that that helps you uh, sort of create excitement and build. And if you look at most crowdfunding campaigns that work well, you can sort of see that as people release content, more and more people join, and more and more uh, money comes in. Um, so uh, on the funding without borders here, you can actually see in our uh, initial funding, that was from all the various countries around the world that uh, actually came and uh, contributed to uh, Star Citizen. Uh, we, had ended, we ended the campaign with a large community of backers uh, from around the globe. We kept focus. Uh, on engaging and reaching out to prospective players who fund us as they enlist. And instead of focusing on a publisher or a deal, we were really focused on the community and the game we wanted to build and the game they wanted to play. So another aspect that we sort of engage in is the development without borders. Um, so you know, there's several aspects to that. First off, uh, we have a different approach um, to the talent, so we don't focus on bringing talent to us and being in one location and fighting with other studios that are maybe in the same city that we are. We actually go to various different places where the talent is. We have a very distributed um, development uh, process. Um, you know, 
want feedback on your design, well, you know, in our minds, it's probably a good idea to get feedback of whether something's good, whether people like it, before you ship. Uh, and developing the game behind closed doors, uh, you know, I, in today's world, it sort of feels like that's not what people want. They want to sort of be connected, find out what's happening, see the progress, get excited by it. Um, so, uh, one card behind. Um, you know, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Twitch, um, they're all about letting users share their experiences. So that was one of the concepts as we carried on with Star Citizen was like, okay, well, why don't we share the development process and not just do updates when we're doing the initial campaign. It's like, why don't we share it as we're doing it along? And, you know, because, you know, I've made a fair number of games and generally inside the development team, as you're making stuff, you see these great things and you get excited, but you don't really have the ability to share that with people outside your group or perhaps, you know, within the small sort of confines of your publisher. And, uh, you know, there's, there's something really cool of sharing what you're doing, and it's exciting for the team, it's exciting for people to see it. So that was kind of the premise with our sort of open development model. So, um, you know, we allow the backers to see everything. So we, they can see the good, the bad. Uh, you know, we make mistakes, and then we correct them. Uh, you know, we're always communicating with them. We have a huge amount of transparency, so we're not always perfect, but people sort of feel like they get, um, you know, the fair, the straight news from us, whether it's good or bad, it's unadulterated. Uh, and the community themselves sort of feel like they're part of the team and feel like they have uh, a say in what happens because you know, they get to play the game and they get to, uh, you know, we're, we haven't finished building the game, we've got a lot of stuff still to do, but we share parts of the game as we build it with them and they give us feedback, we listen to it, it's a, it's a, you know, a very uh, beneficial uh, process. Um, so, uh, in terms of our development without borders, um, yeah, we had a core group of about a dozen. We started in 2012. Um, as of this year, we have six uh, major studios working on the game. Uh, four of them are in-house and two of them are out of house. Uh, but you know, it's across six cities. So we have Los Angeles, which is the headquarters. Um, we have Austin, Texas. We have Manchester, UK, and Frankfurt, Germany are the four um, in-house development studios. And then we have a development partner called Ilphonic that is in uh, Denver, Colorado and another development partner called Behavior that is in Montreal in Canada. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, uh, as we grow our development, it also allows the, our community and our backers to uh, come visit our development locations, and so they can sort of feel engaged and see where we are, see how we, we, we build the game. So, you know, the team gets excitement from being able to share the work with the fans all the time. Uh, the feedback that you get all the time is actually really uh, useful both for making your um, work better, but also for giving you sort of a, an energy for knowing that people care about what you're doing and the, the fact that, you know, if they're excited, then it's much easier to get up in, in the morning to, you know, keep cranking on that huge spaceship that's going to take you six months to build. I mean, you know, game development is not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of love and passion. And uh, when you've got people out there that are really excited by what you're giving them, uh, I think it sort of helps the development team to keep enthusiastic and committed and focused uh, you know, over a, a fairly long period of time, which is what you need in, uh, in today's world for doing you know, sort of large-scale games. Um, so there we go. So the next aspect of uh, sort of without borders is communication without borders. And for us, you know, and I think this is probably true with what everyone's sort of seeing in today's media, but you know, press release and a few screenshots, saving up for a few big reveals in some print magazines, or sort of stage managing your audience with an orchestrated sort of marketing and, and PR campaign six months before your release. Uh, none of that, I think, works very well in today's sort of connected 24-7, constant news stream world that is always wanting new information and new data uh, to share with their readers. Um, so, and for us, I think that, um, you know, in general, I mean, we can say here, uh, you know, you've got things like YouTube and Twitter and Reddit, and these are platforms that people use for sharing their ideas from 140 characters to 4K video, and they're doing it all the time. And so our concept was, well, look, why don't we engage our users with the same variety, the same frequency, the same immediacy that they have come to expect in all these other forms of media? Because I, I just think the consumption of information and media now is, then, is radically different than it, say, used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we do daily updates on our website. We give backers an inside look at the various aspects of the game, the universe, the art, uh, 
uh, you know, everything as it happens, sort of almost in real time. And uh, so here's the ways that we do it. So we have live chat, uh, you know, on our fo and forums where the fans and the community members can interact with the dev development team. They can ask questions like, oh, you know, how, you know, how is the physics working on this spaceship? Uh, and, you know, the physics programmer will actually go and give them an answer. And uh, we do daily development updates. Uh, we do twice weekly uh, full fiction sort of storyline shows. So um, essentially, we're updating sort of the universe, building the universe, the fiction of the universe via our website before they're actually getting to adventure around and, and play it. So it's sort of we're describing characters or locations or places and making this world feel tangible to the community. Um, you know, we do detailed monthly reports um, for the backers from each one of our studios at the end of every month. In fact, the reports that we do on our website are more in-depth than any report I used to do when I was uh, at Origin and we were part of EA or when I was at Digital Anvil and uh, Microsoft was uh, you know, our partner. Um, so I think that kind of says something. Uh, and uh, you know, we also have a monthly magazine that covers our sort of overall development. So like, usually 50 to 70 pages uh, every month. It goes into depth behind how we built a spaceship or how we designed a mechanic or um, you know, what, uh, you know, the behind the scenes goings on when we put a show together and stuff like that. Um, so on top of that, we do uh, consistent video updates. Uh, oops, hang on a sec. I want to head over here. Uh, consistent video updates, uh, roughly one every two days. Um, so I think that's fine. Oops. Sorry, guys. Anyway, there's a video that should be playing there, but maybe I'll do it in the back. Anyway, the consistent video updates, roughly one every two days. Hang on. <laughs> OK, go forward here. Hopefully, the video plays. Anyway, I'll let them do that. So consistent video updates, roughly one every two days. Um, there we go. Multiple weekly web TV shows, behind the scenes focus segments, uh, meet the dev interviews uh, so that people get to see the face and have, uh, you know, see the interaction with various developers we've got. We do trailers and ship commercials. A few of you may have seen those where we actually take our game assets and sort of do these futuristic in-fiction commercials uh, that uh, essentially uh, would be like selling this future spaceship in this future world that helps build the fiction, helps our artists actually finish the ship for public viewing in the game. Uh, and uh, you know, we also do weekly interactive sort of live streams. So after our Around the Verse segment, which is sort of the, the weekly news show, there's sort of an interactive live sound, uh, stream with the fans afterwards. Um, we also do sort of fan-generated um, and community, like we're, we're going to be focused on doing a fair amount of community content. So the next great starship was something that we did last year, which was a competition from the audience, uh, the community of Star Citizen, to say, who out there wants to design a spaceship? Who wants to build a spaceship to you know, a high level of quality and have it in the game? And so we ran uh, this as sort of an ongoing uh, competition where we had sort of video update segments, and the community voted. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, we had the final, which was at the very beginning of May, uh, June. And the Redeemer was a winning ship. And now that winning ship is in Star Citizen and is in the hangar uh, if you happen to have pledged for it or back for it. So it's really cool. That's the first element of uh, sort of fan created, um, you know, a very high quality asset that's in the game. Uh, it was also a great recruiting tool for us. We've actually got a few artists that now work for us that came from the various competitors that were working on the next great starship. And we are going to be committed to doing more of that where we're, where we're bringing in community content. We actually have a trailer that is sort of the official Star Citizen trailer that was inspired by a fan-made trailer originally. And, and those are kind of the aspects that we sort of involve the community. And, and, and you know, they have an incredible amount of creativity and enthusiasm and ideas, and it's, and it's pretty fantastic. Um, so the other thing that we do is we do a lot of live events uh, and direct interaction with the community one-on-one -on -one all around the world. So uh, we do office tours for backers, which I mentioned before. We do town halls, so in PAX South, we actually rented out a theater and put on a bunch of panels for the uh, community members that were at in San Antonio or had come down to PAX South and sort of went over various aspects of the, uh, the uh, persistent universe, which is our sort of big, open, sandbox part of uh, Star Citizen. Uh, and then we also do a lot of events during consumer-driven uh, game shows. So you know, GamesCon in Germany is a big one for us. 
Uh, this last year, we had 2,000 people come to the uh, event that we ran there. Uh, we do it at PAX East. I think we're going to have about 1,200 people at the PAX East that's coming up here. We did it last year. Um, we do stuff at PAX Prime, uh, South by Southwest. Um, you know, we did PAX Australia, where we unveiled the first um, a glimpse of the first-person shooting aspect of Star Citizen. Uh, and, we, and we do CitizenCon, which is sort of the one-year anniversary of the game itself, uh, uh, where we bring sort of backers together and we sort of do a year in review and sort of tease them and show them stuff that we're going to be doing this coming year. So we really engage one-on-one. -on -one. I think the community really appreciates that. I mean, it's really actually pretty awesome to meet people one-on-one -on -one that have, say, you know, love the stuff that you're doing or have played a game that you've made in the past. And you know, that's something you just traditionally don't get in the normal um, old school publishing setup. And uh, you know, that's one of the aspects that I find uh, the most rewarding of what we do. So uh, people travel from all around the globe to meet us. You can actually see this was PAX Australia. And those dots all around there are where everyone came down to Australia to meet us. So obviously quite a lot of people in Australia, but a lot of people from Europe, a lot of people from North America and even you know, some from South America, too, and in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, as you can see. Um, so the other aspect is testing uh, without borders. So you know, I think we all know kind of the problems you get in big, complicated games today, like can't getting online at launch. Not, you know, it doesn't feel like there's enough time spent on polishing. There's bugs and glitches that ruin the experience. Um, so you know, Linux, Firefox, Java, MySQL, all software that focus on constant iteration and open collaborative relationship with its users that create a better experience. So our, kind of our idea was, as we make this game, since it's going to be a large game and it's going to be very complicated, why don't we share elements of the game with our backers, with the community, and get their feedback and let them hammer on aspects of it so we can make a better, more polished game uh, when we finally are ready to release the, 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 full, the full game. So, uh, you know, we have a large community of our active backers, the largest, you know, essentially the largest testing team ever assembled in the games business, I would think. We have hundreds of thousands of people that play our early builds. Uh, so even if you're a big publisher and you've got a massive testing department, it's still pretty hard to compete with several hundred thousand people banging on your code, making sure all the various configurations and all the aspects that you can sort of, you know, you can test it really well, but then when it suddenly goes public, everything falls apart. And that's kind of, I think we've seen that this past year and maybe the year before. And so I think that's a definite advantage we get. Um, we have an open modular development process, uh, which the community you know, helps polish and iterate the features uh, as well, you know, which allows us to sort of, I think, advance the game further than I could have done the old model, because we get a feedback loop much sooner. Uh, and it's the best focus group you could possibly get, because these are people that have loved this kind of game so much, they're willing to give you money long before they can play the final game. And so they're definitely pre-qualified to say, yes, is this a fun game or not a, or not a fun game? Uh, and you know, it helps us on the back end and network side, which is usually one of the problems that you have when you go from testing internally with 50 people or 100 people to suddenly it's been 100,000 or a million people playing it. We're actually getting to hit some of those numbers early. So hopefully our load balancing and, and uh, tech network stability will be much better uh, when we finally do release the game. Um, we also collect a huge amount of uh, sort of metrics from the people from the from our user base playing it, so that helps us also make judgments on balance and playability. So you know all these things I think are helping us shape ultimately a better game. Um, last aspect here, we publish without borders. So you know we don't have the logistics of um, physical selling physical goods. We don't have borders, uh, and you know we don't have everyone taking a, a bite out of the apple as we sell it. So um, you know, Steam, iTunes, Netflix, they've all trained consumers that digital is more convenient, more flexible, and available instantly no matter where they are. So you know, why not deliver your game digitally to the consumers and go one step further by going direct, cutting out the middleman? That's kind of what we've been focusing on. And, and so far, it's been doing pretty well for us. We keep 97 cents of every dollar that's pledged. Uh, so we give a little bit away to PayPal or the credit card processor. Um, but we don't have to deal with a publisher's investment. We don't have to deal with foreign distribution deals or sort of loaded manufacturing costs. Uh, we also have this power to reach backers all over the world via a whole bunch of new mechanisms that you wouldn't have in the past uh, with the old retail model and everything via the, you know, sort of the kind of viral marketing and, and sort of social reach you can get 
uh, you know, and that you know, our, our sort of ship commercials are a good example of we make these sort of very fun, attractive uh, commercials, ones like a BMW commercial, ones like a parody of Top Gear, and then it sort of gets play on the news sites and people share it and then it brings awareness. Some, some people can see it and they haven't heard of Star Citizen and it sort of leads them to us, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, so all of that, uh, you know, allows us to have ambition without borders. And that's how we've raised $72 million so far and counting. It's allowing us to build a game that has unparalleled ambition. It's based on a new IP, which is, you know, for this scale of budget would be fairly unusual. Uh, in a genre that most people considered um, dead on a platform that everybody wrote off, which was the PC. And I don't think everyone's writing off the PC nowadays. Um, but as I said at the beginning, this $72 million is not the most important number that matters to us. So what numbers do matter? 4,189,616 forum posts. And that's a huge amount of engagement for our community to date. We have 1,767 development updates over 846 days. So that's more than two updates a day for over two years. I mean, it's our community team and the development team that helps sort of do those. It's, that's a pretty huge achievement. We have 469 videos that we've shared. There's 181 countries represented by the various backers around the world on Star Citizen. We have 26,030 player organizations, and the biggest of which is Imperium, and has over 10,000 members. And the biggest number is 745,819 engaged supporters. So all of this really means, I, I mean, the message I want to get across is that Star Citizen really is a community, and it's a community without borders. And that's the secret of our success, and the fact that we focus on them from day one is, I think, one of the things that keeps us going and hopefully will sustain us going forward and help us to build, I hope, the best game I've ever made. Um, so we've shifted the paradigm of funding, development, communication, publishing, and community to better align with today's connected and sharing involved world. And I actually would think that you know, in this audience, you do not necessarily have to make a space game or a PC game or even have it crowdfunded. But a lot of the things that we do on the community aspect and involving and the open development, those are all things that I believe really strongly in. And I think, uh, you know, if more people embrace them, I think they would see uh, an engagement that, you know, maybe they haven't seen before, or an uplift that they haven't seen before, or just, you know, have a sense of reward that they haven't had before. And it's definitely, for me, uh, the way that I think a lot of development will be happening in the future. Um, you know, so I think you, know, you guys can do the same thing because it takes a community to build a universe. And there you go. That's the end of my very short speech. Thank you, guys. <laughs>